Morocco was his homeland, but he traveled to every civilized portion of the known non-Western world. From Morocco to China, from Russia to Mali, from Spain to Sumatra, he covered a staggering amount of ground, some 75,000 miles or 120,000 kilometers, not counting many detours. He covered that ground by spending 30 years of his life visiting every Muslim country of his day and recorded in accurate detail the social and political life he observed on his journeys. Not only was he an explorer and diplomat, he became a lawyer and a learned scholar too. In 1325, he left his parental home for pilgrimage in Mecca. He narrated the beginning of his journeys as follows. I left Tangiers my birthplace on Thursday 2nd Rajab, 725 Hijra, with the intention of going on pilgrimage to Mecca. I was alone, without companions, not in a caravan, but I was stirred by a powerful urge to reach my goal, Mecca. I left my friends and my home, just as a bird leaves its parental nest. My father and mother were still alive, and with great pain, I parted with them. For me, as for them, it was cause of insufferable illness. I was then only 22. Ibn Battuta was born in Tangier, part of modern-day Morocco, on February 25th, 1304. The men in Ibn Battuta's family were legal scholars, and he was raised with a focus on education. However, there was no madrasa or college of higher learning in Tangier. Thus, Ibn Battuta's urge to travel was spurred by interest in finding the best teachers and the best libraries, which were then in Alexandria, Cairo, and Damascus. He also wanted to make the pilgrimage to Mecca called the Hajj as soon as possible. So this is where his journey starts in preparation for Hajj. After riding through the mountainous interior of Morocco, Ibn Battuta arrived at the busy trading city of Tlemcen. From there, he set off into a pilgrimage trail through an area where few people live. He could have traveled through the green brown valleys for several days at a time without encountering any towns, only Berber camps and groups of camel herders. Finally, he caught up with a caravan of other travelers, including pilgrims like himself. Some of them walked, others rode horses, mules, donkeys, or camels. The pilgrims in this caravan were an enthusiastic group and were excited about their Hajj. The trip was a grand study tour of the Dar al-Islam, but for Ibn Battuta, it was an opportunity to acquire knowledge of religion and law and meet with other Muslim scholars. In the early spring of 1326, after a journey of over 3,500 kilometers, Ibn Battuta arrived at the port of Alexandria, and at the time, part of the Bahri Mamluk Empire. He spent several weeks visiting sites in the area, and then headed inland to Cairo. I arrived at the city of Cairo, mother of cities mistress of broad provinces and fruitful lands, boundless in multitude of buildings, peerless in beauty and splendor, the meeting place of comer and goer, the stopping place of feeble and strong. She, Cairo, surges as the waves of the sea with her throngs of folk and can scarce contain them. Ibn Battuta was particularly impressed with a Morrison or hospital for its beauty and for its service to the sick. Such hospitals demonstrated Islamic commitment to charity. A later traveler echoed this enthusiasm. Cubicles for patients were ranged round two courts, and at the size of another quadrangle were wards, lecture rooms, library, baths. 
dispensary, and every necessary appliance of those days of surgical science. There was even music to cheer the sufferers. While reader of the Quran afforded the consolations of the faith, rich and poor were treated alike without fees and 60 orphans were supported and educated in the neighboring school. Ibn Battuta stayed in Cairo about one month, but he decided to proceed to Mecca on his own by way of Upper Egypt and the Red Sea port of Aidhad, and from there by ship to Jeddah on the Arabian coast. This was generally a safe route under the protection of the Sultan, but it took longer and was less traveled than the route across the Sinai. Ibn Battuta was probably interested in being a tourist again and chose this route. His trip up the Nile took him almost three weeks. He traveled by land rather than on the river, and along the way he lodged at the homes of scholars, qadis, judges, and sufis, or in college dormitories. His trip was without major incident. However, he does write about a major incident showing his attitudes toward modesty. One day, I entered the bathhouse and found men in it wearing no cover. This appeared a shocking thing to me, and I went to the governor and informed him of it. He told me not to leave and ordered the owners of the bathhouses to be brought before him. Articles were formally drawn up making them subject to penalties. If any person should enter a bath, without a waist wrapper, and the governor behaved to them with the greatest severity, after which I took leave of him. Leaving the Nile, he set out on camel with a party of Bedouin Arabs towards the Red Sea, which took about 15 days. Here we found that the local ruling family was in revolt against the Mamluk governor. They had sunk some ships and threatened further violence. So Ibn Battuta was forced to retrace his steps and proceed back to Cairo and take a northern route to Mecca, this time to Mamluk-controlled Damascus. The diversion held an added advantage because of the holy places that lay along the way, including Hebron, Jerusalem, and Bethlehem. The Mamluk authorities spared no efforts in keeping the route safe for pilgrims. Without his help, many travelers would be robbed and murdered. After spending the Muslim month of Ramadan in Damascus, he joined a caravan traveling the 1,300 kilometer, 810 miles south to Medina. After four days in the town, he journeyed on to Mecca while visiting holy sites along the way. Upon his arrival to Mecca, as he describes the rites of the pilgrimage interspersed with the mesmerizing chant of Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. Describing the day of Arafah, Ibn Battuta says, in the morning, I join a great procession. Like a river, it flows towards the plain of Arafah and the Mount of Mercy, covered in pilgrims wearing their white ihram. Their hands raised in prayer highlight the continuity of the rites of Hajj through the ages. Ibn Battuta met new people from all around the Muslim world who had also gathered for the Hajj. Many poor pilgrims lived in the mosque while they were in Mecca. They ate, slept, and prayed there. The mosque was busy day and night with worshipers. In order to complete the Hajj, Ibn Battuta joined other pilgrims to journey east of the city through desert ravines to the plain of Arafah. The ceremonies in the desert make up the heart of the annual Hajj or great pilgrimage. Many pilgrims soon returned home to their ordinary lives. For Ibn Battuta, this was an end and a beginning. He had no intentions of returning to Morocco. He had earned the title Al-Hajj, which gave him respect in learned circles, and was now ready to continue his travels. Following a month spent in Mecca, Ibn Battuta joined a large caravan of pilgrims returning to Iraq across the Arabian Peninsula. The group headed north to Medina and then traveling at night turned northeast across the Najj Plateau to Najaf on a journey that lasted about two weeks. In Najaf, he visited the mausoleum of Ali, the fourth caliph. Then instead of continuing to Baghdad, 
with a caravan, Ibn Battuta started a six-month detour that took him into Iran. From Najaf, he journeyed to Wasit, then followed the river Tigris south to Basra. His next destination was the town of Isfahan, across the Zagros Mountains in Iran. He then headed south to Shiraz, a large flourishing city spared the destruction wrought by Mongol invaders on many more northerly towns. He describes the women of Shiraz. The people of Shirza are distinguished by piety, sound religion, and purity of manners, especially the women. These wear boots and then out of doors are swathed in mantles and head veils so that no part of them is to be seen. And they are noted for their charitable alms and their liberality. One of their strange customs is that they meet in the principal mosque every Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Sometimes one or two thousand of them. I have never seen in any land an assembly of women in such numbers. Finally, he returned across the mountains to Baghdad, arriving there in June 1327. Parts of the city were still ruined from the damage inflicted by Hulagu Khan's invading army in 1258. In Baghdad, he found Abu Sa'id, the last Mongol ruler of the unified Ilkhanate. This Ilkhan was an example of how the Mongol warrior descendants had become Persian and Muslim. Ibn Battuta left again for Baghdad, but first took an excursion northwards along the river Tigris. He visited Mosul, where he was the guest of the Ilkhanate. Once back in Mosul, he joined a feeder caravan of pilgrims heading south to Baghdad, where they would meet up with the main caravan that crossed the Arabian desert to Mecca. Ill with diarrhea, he arrived in the city weak and exhausted for his second Hajj. Ibn Battuta needed a rest. In a year, he had traveled more than 4,000 miles, crossed mountains and deserts, visited most of the great cities of Iraq, and Western Persia, met scholars, saints, judges, and even a Mongol king. In Mecca, living piously in the company of devout men, he says, the life I lead is one of the most agreeable. I was always part of the processions around the Kaaba, in the service of God, and in the closeness of the holy sites. About one year later in Mecca, where he led a life of prayer, fellowship, and learning, he was ready to travel again. He went to Jeddah on the Red Sea coast where he and other pilgrims were crammed into a small ship. We traveled on this sea with a favoring wind for two days, but thereafter the wind changed and drove us off course. The waves of the sea entered in amongst us in the vessel and the passengers fell grievously sick. After a brief stay in Taiz, he continued down to the coastal city of Aden from Aden, Ibn Battuta embarked on a ship heading for Zela on the coast of Somalia. He then moved on to Cape Guardafui, further down the Somali seaboard, spending about a week in each location. Later, he would visit Mogadishu, the then prominent city of the land of the Berbers Mogadishu stood at the zenith of its prosperity. He described it as an exceedingly large city with many rich merchants, noted for its high quality fabric that was exported to other countries, including Egypt. Ibn Battuta continued by ship south to the Swahili coast, a region then known in Arabic as Bilad az Zanj, land of the Zanj, with an overnight stop at the island town of Mombasa. After a journey along the coast, Ibn Battuta next arrived in the land town of Kilwa and present day Tanzania. Ibn Battuta sailed back to Arabia, first to Oman and the Strait of Hormuz, then on to Mecca for the Hajj of 1330. After his third pilgrimage to Mecca, Ibn Battuta decided to seek employment with the Sultan of Delhi, Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Ibn Battuta and the other newcomers went to greet the ruler with their gifts. On a gold-plated throne sat a tall, healthy, white-skinned man. I approached the Sultan who took my hand and shook it and continuing to hold it addressed me most kindly saying in Persian, your arrival is a blessing. 
be at ease. I shall give you such favors that your fellow countrymen will hear of it and come to join you. Every time he said any encouraging word to me, I kissed his hand until I had kissed it seven times. And after he had given me a robe of honor, I withdrew. The Sultan was welcoming scholars and judges from abroad and gave them high paying jobs. But first, Ibn Battuta had to find a guide, someone who could speak Persian and knew India well. So in 1330, he went to the town of Jidda in the Red Sea. After looking unsuccessfully for a guide to India for several months, he decided to continue his travels. This time he would go northward to Anatolia, modern Turkey. From there, he could connect with Turkish caravans going to India. He traveled back into Egypt where he met a friend and they went by caravan to Damascus, Syria, and from there set out for Anatolia. When Ibn Battuta arrived in Iznik, which had just been conquered by Orhan, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Orhan was away and his wife was in command of the nearby stationed soldiers. Ibn Battuta gave this account of Orhan's wife, a pious and excellent woman. She treated me honorably, gave me hospitality, and sent gifts. Ibn Battuta's account of Orhan, the greatest of the kings of the Turkmens, and the richest in wealth, lands, and military forces. Of fortresses, he possessed nearly a hundred, and for most of his time, he is continually engaged in making a round of them staying in each fortress for some days to put it in good order and examine its condition. It is said that he has never stayed for a whole month in any one town. He also fights with the infidels continually and keeps them under siege. Now in all the lands inhabited by the Turkmens in Anatolia in every district, town, and village, there are to be found members of the organization known as the Young Brotherhood. Nowhere in the world Will you find men so eager to welcome strangers, so prompt to serve food and satisfy the wants of others? The members of this community work during the day to gain their livelihood and bring what they have earned in the late afternoon. With this, they buy fruit, food, and other things which the hospice requires for their use. If a traveler comes to town that day, they lodge him and he stays with them until he goes away. If there are no travelers, they themselves assemble to partake of the food, and having eaten it, they sing and dance. On the morrow, they return to their occupations and bring their earnings to their leader in the late afternoon. Ibn Battuta shared his impression of Turkish women, a remarkable thing, which I saw in this country was a respect shown to women by the Turks for they hold a more dignified position than men. Ibn Battuta had also visited Bursa, which at the time was the capital of the Ottoman Beylik. He described Bursa as a great and important city with fine bazaars and wide streets, surrounded on all sides with gardens and running springs. Ibn Battuta entered India through the high mountains of Afghanistan, following the footsteps of Turkish warriors who a century earlier had conquered the Hindu farming people of India and established the Sultanate of Delhi. From the Maldives, he carried on to Sri Lanka and visited Sri Pada and Tanavram Temple. Ibn Battuta's ship almost sank on embarking from Sri Lanka only for the vessel that came to his rescue to suffer an attack by pirates. Stranded on shore, he worked his way back to Madurai Kingdom in India. Here he spent some time in the court of the short-lived Madurai Sultanate under Ghiasuddin Muhammad Damghani, from where he returned to the Maldives and boarded a Chinese junk, still intending to reach China and take up his ambassadorial post. He reached the port of Chittagong in modern-day Bangladesh, intending to travel the Silat to meet Shah Jalal who became so renowned that Ibn Battuta, then in Chittagong, made a one-month journey through the mountains of Kamaru, near Silat, to meet him. On his way to Silat, Ibn Battuta was greeted by several of Shah Jalal's disciples, who had come to assist him on his journey. 
many days before he had arrived. At the meeting in 1345 CE, Ibn Battuta noted that Shah Jalal was tall and lean, fair in complexion, and lived by the mosque in a cave, where his only item of value was a goat he kept for milk, butter, and yogurt. He observed that the companions of the Shah Jalal were foreign and known for their strength and bravery. He also mentions that many people would visit the Shah to seek guidance. Back in Chittagong, he caught a Chinese junk and went to Samudra on the island of Sumatra. This really was the end of Dar al-Islam, for no territory east of this was ruled by a Muslim ruler. Here he stayed for about two weeks in the wooden walled town as a guest of the Sultan. The Sultan then provided him with supplies and sent Ibn Battuta on one of his own junks to China. But he seems to have been in culture shock, discomfort at being in a culture he didn't understand or appreciate. China was beautiful, but it did not please me. On the contrary, I was greatly troubled thinking about the way paganism dominated this country. Whenever I went out of my lodging, I saw many blameworthy things that disturbed me so much that I stayed indoors most of the time and only went out when necessary. During my stay in China, whenever I saw any Muslim, I always felt as though I were meeting my own family and close kinsmen. Ibn Battuta had arrived in the last peaceful years before the collapse of the Mongol Yuan dynasty rule. He noted, China is the safest and most agreeable country in the world for the traveler. You can travel all alone across the land for nine months without any fear, even if you are carrying much wealth. Ibn Battuta began his journey back to Morocco, and Kazi Kodi, he once again considered throwing himself at the mercy of Muhammad bin Tughluq in Delhi, but though better of it, and decided to carry on to Mecca. On his way to Basra, he passed through the Strait of Hormuz, where he learned that Abu Sa'id, last ruler of the Ilkhanid dynasty, had died in Iran. Abu Sa'id's territories had subsequently collapsed due to a fierce civil war between the Iranians and Mongols. In 1348, Ibn Battuta arrived in Damascus with the intention of retracing the route of his first Hajj. He then learned that his father had died 15 years earlier and death became the dominant theme for the next year or so. The Black Death had struck and he stopped in Homs as a plague spread through Syria, Palestine, and Arabia. He heard of terrible death tolls in Gaza, but returned to Damascus that July, where the death toll had reached 2,400 victims each day. When he stopped in Gaza, he found it was depopulated. And in Egypt, he stayed at Abu Sir. Reportedly, deaths in Cairo had reached levels of 1,100 each day. He made Hajj to Mecca. Then, he decided to return to Morocco, nearly a quarter of a century after leaving home. On the way, he made one last detour to Sardinia. Then, in 1349, returned to Tangier, by way of Fez, only to discover that his mother had also died a few months before. Ibn Battuta had left Morocco in 1325 at the age of 21, and by the time he returned he was about 45, but he was still interested in traveling and adventure. Ibn Battuta set out for a trip to the Muslim-controlled territory of Al-Andalus on the Iberian Peninsula. After his departure from Al-Andalus, he decided to travel through Morocco. On his return home, he stopped for a while in Marrakesh, which was almost a ghost town following the recent plague and the transfer of the capital of Fez. Morocco was at peace. The Sultan was planning the construction of a great college. It would be a good time to settle down, to study, or to become a judge or a teacher. But there was an important Muslim king he had not yet met Mansa Suleiman, Emperor of Mali. He planned his next trip southward across the Sahara Desert to the capital of Mali, 1,500 miles away. He went to Timbuktu, a town that was just beginning to flower as a center of Islamic scholarship and trade. Mansa Musa himself had a mosque built there. Ibn Battuta 
was evidently not very impressed with Timbuktu, a city that would become great in the 15th and 16th century. His return journey was even more difficult. He had brought a riding camel and another to carry his supplies. But in the desert, one camel died. Other travelers offered to help carry his supplies. But further on, Ibn Battuta fell sick again. He recovered in a small town called Takadda. Here, Ibn Battuta received a message from the Sultan of Morocco, commanding him to return to Fez immediately. They left Takadda on September 11, 1353. The caravan went northward for 18 days through the wilderness and passed through the land of the veiled Berber nomads, whom Ibn Battuta called good for nothing. We encountered one of their chief men who held up the caravan until he was paid an impost of cloth and other things. They continued on and stopped at Sijil Masa, where he stayed about two weeks. Then he went over the high Atlas Mountains in the dead of winter. I have seen difficult roads and much snow in other parts of the world, but I never saw a road difficult than that. At last, he arrived in the capital Fez, a city that was center of the intellectual universe west of Cairo. It was 1354. He was home, this time for good. The Sultan of Morocco listened to his report on Mali. He also listened to Ibn Battuta's other adventures and ordered him to stay in Fez. He wanted to have these stories written down for the amusement of his family and others. Travel writing, especially accounts of the Hajj, were a popular form of writing at the time. So Ibn Battuta was commanded to dictate an account of the cities which he had seen in his travel and of the interesting events which had clung to his memory and that he should speak of those whom he had met of the rulers of countries of their pious distinguished men of learning and their pious saints the sultan hired a young writer ibn juzay the young man ibn battuta had met in granada three years earlier ibn juzay must have been excited about such a task he had been fascinated by Ibn Battuta's stories earlier. And as a young writer, this job was one that could earn him respect. He was to put the stories into the proper form of a travel book called a rihla. Rihla means voyage in Arabic. And it was a genre type of Arab literature that combined a description of travel, travelogue, with commentary on the people and practices of Islam throughout the Muslim world. But in the years that followed, as the Arab world went further into decline and the torch of exploration passed to the West, the book all but disappeared. Ironically, when the Rihla was finally resurrected in the 19th century, it was by Westerners, and the book was soon translated into French, German, and English. His life is an endless challenge and challenges cannot possibly be good or bad. Challenges are simply challenges. Ibn Battuta went through challenges on his quest to gain knowledge. He left his birthplace, family, his courage and bravery. He stayed strong all throughout his life, adventurous and ready to try new things. He traveled thousands of miles over mountains and through valleys, all so he could better himself to travel the world, observe so many new cultures, and meet new people as he did. He did not only learn more, he found new eyes during his voyage. Whenever he faced a challenge, he said yes and never backed down. He truly was a warrior, an Arab traveler, and a writer.